I want to start today by telling you how I got here. And to do that, I want to bring you into how I've been feeling for a while now. An analogy will help. So back in the 90s, I'm a child of the 90s. It's been long enough where it's cool to say that. <laughs> there was something of a trope that got popular in big Hollywood movies. Hollywood really got into disaster films, big cataclysmic disasters, like a volcano, an asteroid, maybe some giant tidal wave, everything was gonna freeze, I don't know. Maybe it was a virus brought over from the jungle by a capuchin monkey. In every one of those movies, you had this one particular character, not the hero, Jeff Goldblum or something. He was always some kind of scientist, kind of a weirdo. And that person saw the problem kind of before everybody else and more or less freaked out. They tried to tell public officials, the public, anyone who would listen, something catastrophic is on the way. So 20 something years later out of the 90s, that's me. I'm not Jeff Goldblum. He got eaten by a dinosaur on a toilet. <laughs> I think I'm Dustin Hoffman, and this is like a virus outbreak. A huge cultural shift is taking place right under our noses, and this could end badly for a lot of people. And it comes in a pretty box, social justice. So I want you to come away today seeing what's inside that box and to see that it doesn't match what's on the picture on the outside. My worried scientist moment hit just over two years ago. For a few years up to that point, I had been noticing a lot of prominent public intellectuals, thinkers I respected, getting accused of things like sexism and racism for reasons that didn't stack up. Reasonable folks like Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris, Sir Tim Hunt, the ESA scientist Matt Taylor, who landed humanity's first spaceship on a comet and had made the mistake of wearing a bowling shirt with attractive cartoon women on it and was pilloried for that. Being that I have two cognitive allergies, one to bullshit and the other to unfairness, I couldn't leave this alone and I engaged it frequently on the internet, which is of course the best place to engage anything. So every time I engaged, if I found somebody who would discuss it with me, I was told that racism and sexism are systems. And I'd get referred to technical definitions that appeared in the academic literature and what I assumed at the time was sociology. This eventually got me looking into gender studies. And at first I came away thinking, okay, there's racism, there's sexism, and then there's this other idea, systemic racism or systemic sex sexism, they're two different things. And I was really frustrated that the people who kept calling these folks I respected racist and sexist wouldn't take pains to distinguish between them. They just said racism. They just said sexism. To me, loosely associating someone with a vague system of racism or sexism isn't nearly the same thing as them actually being racist or sexist. As these accusations kept piling up, I got more and more curious about them. Eventually, I gave in. <laughs> I resisted it for a really long time, actually, and I decided to carefully read one specific paper that kept coming across my path two and a half years ago today. It was about something called feminist glaciology. <laughs> what on earth is feminist glaciology, you might wonder, because I did. So as they say in the paper, quote, feminist theories and critical epistemologies, especially feminist political ecology and feminist post-colonial studies, open up new perspectives and analyses of the history of glaciological knowledge. So I know that's a lot of jargon, but I want to hone in on one particular word, kind of like Dr. Boghossian did this morning. Critical is the word I want to talk about today. That paper was my first full-on direct exposure to critical methods. That's what I want to speak some truth to today. 
And my first hands-on experience with critical theory was not a good one, as my family and colleagues here can tell you. As it happens, I recorded that experience in the notes I took as I went through that paper in detail. And they began simply enough with entries such as, glaciers are key to climate change. Yeah, okay. Ice should be seen as a part of society, as historical, seen through a cultural framing of glaciers. Glaciers have huge social impact. I have notes that go on to say, this paper is full of weird stuff, <laughs> like a need to explore the relationship between gender and glaciers. <laughs> this paper is very concerned about power, I wrote, like, quote, there is even less from a feminist perspective that focuses on gender, understood here not as a male-female binary, but as a range of personal and social possibilities, and also on power, justice, inequality, and knowledge production in the context of ice, glacier change, and glaciology." End quote. So glacier science doesn't focus enough on power. I wrote, the goal of the paper is to critically uncover the under-examined history of glaciological knowledge and glacier-related sciences. At this point, I was already thinking something might be wrong here. I didn't want to jump to conclusions. I wanted to get through the paper. Things kept going downhill. My notes got a little more colorful. A little further down, I wrote, the paper seems to call for people to write stories and make films about, their way, about the ways their lives interact with the glaciers, rather than just studying them scientifically, and to consider these art projects within the scope of scientific glaciology. This is insane. <laughs> there are other administrations to include art projects as though they are science. Quote, Scottish visual artist Katie Patterson chronicled the ordinary sounds of three glaciers in Iceland and then transferred the audio tracks to LP microgroove vinyl ice records, records created by casting and freezing the glacier's own meltwater. She then played the frozen records simultaneously on three turntables as they melted. The audio recordings, available at www.katiepatterson.org slash ice records, fuse glacier sounds with the high wine of the ice record itself. After 10 minutes, the actual ice LP record deteriorates and the sound melts away. Next to that quote, I wrote, no shit, it really says that like it's science. <laughs> I had a background in physics. I was having a hard time with this paper. <laughs> By the end, I had notes that were a little simpler, like, holy hell, I can't believe they put examples like this. The very last note I wrote reads, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> well, it turns out I was wrong. <laughs> I could still do it. Not only did I finish that paper as of this two years later or so, I've done almost nothing else but read critical theory. It's been great for my mental well-being and happiness, I assure you. <laughs> and now I finally understand what's going on. Spoiler alert. The infected monkey is loose in the city, and just like in the movie, people don't believe the threat is real. The problem is that the contents of social justice don't match the pretty diversity picture on the box. Social justice activists say it's just about respecting people. It's about making the world more fair and just. That's the picture on the box. That's not what's inside the box. I want you to look inside the box with me today. So I'm not going to tell you what social justice and critical theory are about today. We are going to look inside the box together. I'm going to read what they say what they teach straight out of one of their books. And we'll see. This book, Is Everyone Really Equal? by Aslam Sensoy and Robin D'Angelo. Her name keeps coming up. Which came out in 2012. It's in its second edition now. This is the first. This isn't some fringe book. It's highly esteemed in our pre-service teacher education programs. And it has been widely taught from to our future educators. 
It has also been widely and generously distributed, often for free, to the administrators of many school systems, at least across North America. And you may not recognize the author's names, I guess you kind of do at this point, <laughs> but there's a good chance you've heard some of their ideas. Robin D'Angelo, as you heard already, is the critical theory educator who is responsible for the concept of white fragility. She's not a fringe character, she's big time now. Not only does she have another book titled White Fragility, they rested on the New York Times bestseller list last year for many months. She's also handsomely paid many thousands of dollars per stop on her busy lecture circuit where she tells other white people, she's also white, that they are racists, especially if they don't think they are racists. So let's have a look at what she says about what's inside the social justice box. Let's start with the concept social justice. While some scholars and activists prefer to use the term social justice in order to reclaim its true commitments, in this book we use the term critical social justice. So here's a first truth to speak to social justice. The authors of this book tell us exactly what they mean by social justice and that it isn't what you might expect. It isn't just treating people with more respect, caring about issues of race, sex, sexuality, and so on, or trying to make society more fair. That's the picture on the box, or as they put it, it's true commitments. And they tell us, they, not me, they tell us that it's not what's inside. What's inside? Critical social justice. This is the same critical as in critical theory and as in the feminist glaciology paper. How do they define it? Critical theory refers to a specific scholarly approach that explores the historical, cultural, and ideological lines of authority that underlie social conditions. Of course, they elaborate a bit more. So critical theory is principally concerned with power, the lines of authority that underlie social conditions. This, they tell us a few pages later, ultimately derives from philosophers in the Frankfurt School in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. That school, as they tell us, quote, was guided by the belief that society should work toward the ideals of equality and social betterment, end quote. Okay, social betterment, as defined by who? Not you, not me, by the critical theorists, of course. Not any individual person figuring life out for himself or herself the best they can, unless they too are critical theorists. These philosophers in the Frankfurt School include some famous names, Max Horkheimer, Theodore Adorno. Much could be said about them and the other members of the Frankfurt School if we had time, but for now, Let's just focus on how they characterized a critical theory. In 1937, in Traditional and Critical Theory, Horkheimer explained that to be a critical theory, a theory has to meet all of three criteria. First, it must be explanatory. And this sounds right, except he meant it in a particular way. A critical theory doesn't have to explain how things work. It has to explain what is wrong with society particularly liberal society and Western civilization, as these have proceeded since the Enlightenment. Second, a critical theory must be practical. That means it must be able to be put into practical application by dedicated social activists. Third, a critical theory must be normative. That's a fancy way of saying it carries a moral agenda. It must provide both clear norms for criticism and achievable practical goals for social transformation. So specifically, a critical theory demands that we reconsider the facts of society in their moral terms. In other words, for a theory to be a critical theory, it has to apply its moral vision to society in order to fundamentally transform it at the social level. The critical theorists felt this way because they believe that liberalism is fatally flawed and in need of replacing with something they called ideal democracy. 
I just heard the other day that that's apparently how many communists, card-carrying communists, uh, describe communism, is that it provides the access to a ideal democracy. So with that in mind, let's see what a commitment to critical theoretical approaches means today. That was a long time ago. So we'll read again from Sensoy and D'Angelo. The definition we apply is rooted in a critical theoretical approach. While this approach refers to a broad range of fields, there are some important shared principles. All people are individuals, but they are also members of social groups. These social groups are valued unequally in society. Social groups that are val valued more highly have greater access to the resources of a society. Social injustice is real, exists today, and results in unequal access to resources between groups of people. Okay, so so far, maybe you're a little like, eh, okay, I don't know about that, but it's nothing to freak out about. Let's go on. Those who claim to be for social justice must be engaged in self-reflection about their own socialization into these groups, their positionality, and must strategically act from that awareness in ways that challenge social injustice. This action requires a commitment to an ongoing and lifelong process. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> Being for social justice requires a commitment to an ongoing and lifelong process of soul searching about one's identity as defined by the social theory that they are promoting, plus taking on enlightened social activism on its behalf. That's the minimum requirements. This probably isn't what you think you're signing up for when you hear it's just about treating people with more respect. Just in case that isn't clear enough, Sensoy and D'Angelo also tell us why they make the distinction between what we might consider a traditional approach to social justice, what's on its box, the true commitments, versus a critical approach to social justice, what's inside that box. Pull them out again. We do so in order to distinguish our standpoint on social justice from mainstream standpoints. A critical approach to social justice refers to specific theoretical perspectives that recognize that society is stratified, that is divided and unequal, in significant and far-reaching ways along social group lines that include race, class, gender, sexuality, and ability. Critical social justice recognizes inequality as deeply embedded in the fabric of society, that is, as structural, and actively seeks to change this. So notice that they first reiterate here that the picture on the box doesn't match its contents, and they know it. We do so in order to distinguish our standpoint on social justice from mainstream standpoints. The thing they are teaching isn't what people believe they are teaching. And pay attention to what it says we need to change. They told us in black and white, utterly confident that they are correct, the very fabric of society is what needs to be changed. There's a term for that. We call it social revolution. This is a real glimpse inside the box of social justice. Not fairness, not respect, not equal pay. Social revolution. To unmake our current system and replace it with one they are socially engineering for us. That's what you are signing up for when you sign up for your lifelong commitment to social justice, your part in their social revolution. And they don't try to hide this. <laughs> That's the most amazing part. They say it over and over again, confidently, assuredly, and almost everything they write, but almost nobody is listening to them. And even fewer of us take them seriously at their own words, because it sounds properly crazy. For example, Rochelle Gutierrez, who teaches math education at the University of Illinois, has written, quote, much of what currently counts as scholarship in mathematics education assumes we will work within the given system or expand what we currently count as the status quo. Within mathematics education, we have convinced ourselves that equity is a strong enough agenda, excuse me, a strong enough agenda when maybe revolution should be our goal. What I'm trying to tell you today is that revolution is their goal. 
Now, if you will take a moment and take in our surroundings. We're in the National Liberal Club, in the Gladstone Library, among the greatest bastions for liberalism in the world, where a flag for liberalism was planted. Liberalism is concerned with freedom. Liberalism believes in the individual and his or her dignity. That people should be judged by the contents of their character because that's really what determines who they are. Liberalism believes in the universal. That there are unalienable rights attached to what it means to be human. Liberalism accepts the objective that there is a reality out there and we can know something about it. Liberalism, although you probably haven't heard it put this way before, is a system of conflict management that allows advanced society to exist. It works by guaranteeing freedoms to speak or not, to worship or not, to make use of one's property as one will, to disagree or not, to think for oneself as one will. Liberalism as a set of systems built the modern world over the last five centuries. And with it came the lowest infant mortality rates, the lowest poverty rates, the greatest access to health, travel, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that the world has ever seen. Rooms like this one, the one we are in now, were built to promote and defend this system. So welcome. That's why we're here. That's why this conference was held here. So we have to ask ourselves, why do we need to defend liberalism? Because liberalism, for all of its resilience, is also fragile, as all the early liberals knew, like the critical theorists also realized. The critical theorists in the Frankfurt School and since didn't and don't trust liberalism. They were faltering Marxists who were already disillusioned with capitalism and who were becoming increasingly disillusioned with a society that seems to like it. For them, the problem was that liberalism lets people make their own choices. And of course, people can't be trusted to choose the right things. At the time, they were concerned with people choosing fascism. So maybe that's fair enough. It wasn't just them, however. Critical theorists in the postmodern line, Helen just spoke about, they gained prominence from the 1960s to the 1980s. They patronized us with other worries about the free choices of everyday people. Just like their forebears in the Frankfurt School, they worried that most people choose badly, largely including by not choosing art and poetry and other vestiges of high culture when given the choice. They said that people can't choose the right way because they're fed a steady diet of false consumer goods and images. Jean Baudrillard was particularly concerned with this. Others, like Michel Foucault and Jacques Derrida, worried that our means of gathering knowledge and communicating it were little more than instruments of power that create injustice. Their solution was that knowledge and language needed to be deconstructed for our own emancipation. Critical theorists since agree with this, but have realized they must also reconstruct society according to social justice designs. And critical theorists have been cited more than any other type of scholar in history. Citation counts tell us something about a scholar's influence. Top scholars in many fields get a few tens of thousand citations over their career. Nearly all of the, fun, the, the foundational critical theorists have either tens or hundreds of thousands of citations. Michel Foucault alone has the most. He's been cited over 900,000 times, according to Google Scholar. So critical ideas have been very influential, very widespread. And what do they do? Over and over again, they use what they call criticism to tear down liberalism and freedom, the freedom to speak, to think, and to choose as we will, and to be the arbiters of our own lives, which they believe is a myth and replace our freedoms with something better. We've seen this kind of thing before, and it didn't work then either. But we might hope that we know better now, right? No. The critical theorists of today still reject liberalism openly and want to overthrow it so they can replace it with their own social engineering project. 
As Sensoy and D'Angelo tell us, this written in 2012, still taught today, especially to our teachers, so thus to our children and our grandchildren. A moment to find page five. These movements, meaning the critical theory movements, initially advocated for a type of liberal humanism, individualism, freedom, and peace, but quickly turned to a rejection of liberal humanism. The ideal of individual autonomy that underlies liberal humanism, the idea that people are free to make independent rational decisions that determine their own fate, was viewed as a mechanism for keeping the marginalized in their place by obscuring larger structural systems of inequality. In other words, it, liberalism, fooled people into believing that they had more freedom and choice than societal structures actually allow. So this lets us take a look, reveals the truth of what social justice and its critical methods want. They want a social revolution that dismantles those societal structures. They want to dismantle liberalism and replace it with something that they tell us rejects liberalism at its roots. The objective of social justice is to deconstruct liberal societies and reconstruct them as social justice societies, where they determine what is right and what is wrong for everybody. So here's another truth. They tell us constantly the way that they'll get their revolution is to apply and teach critical theory as widely as possible. What the theorists ranging from the Frankfurt School to the radical new left in the 50s and 60s to the postmodern deconstructionists to today's social justice warriors all understand and count on everyone else not understanding is one simple truth. Constant cynical criticism is a solvent that can dissolve liberal societies. That's, <clears throat> this lets us start telling the truth about their tactics. Their tactics are simple. Cynical criticism, doing it and teaching other people to do it all the time, everywhere, about anything. It doesn't matter whether your criticism is based in genuine understanding of what you're complaining about. The point is to complain and to criticize everything, even when it doesn't make sense, and especially at times when it is unfair. As Horkheimer said, the point of a critical theory is to explain what is wrong with society. He was quite clear from the beginning that another type of theorizing entirely is used to understand how things work. He called those theories traditional theories. And he took pains to make clear that they are not critical theory. So if you remember when Sensoy and D'Angelo told us that critical approaches to social justice use, quote, specific theoretical perspectives that recognize that society is unfair and needs to change, they meant these, they meant critical perspectives. Not ones that necessarily take earnest or rigorous pains to understand what is going on before they attempt to change it. Critical theorists like Horkheimer, Adorno, Sensoy, and D'Angelo understand that the weakness of a liberal society lies in its greatest strength. It eagerly invites criticism. This is because the alchemy of a liberal society depends on being willing to examine what it is doing wrong so that it can admit the mistake and correct it. That alchemy, liberalism's openness to earnest criticism is precisely what led it to create modernity which most of us would recognize as the biggest boom in human progress, real human progress, in our hundreds of thousands of years on this planet. Criticism is great in the right amounts, especially when it's well-informed and well-considered. But constant cynical criticism from a big enough group, especially of under-informed complainers, is a solvent that can dissolve liberal societies. Critical theorists like Horkheimer, ranging through D'Angelo, therefore understood that to tear down a liberal society, you just need one thing. You just have to get a large enough group of people to complain constantly about how society can be understood as unfair or unjust, as cheating them or somebody they care about, whether that's based in genuine understanding of the circumstances or not. They don't have to offer solutions. They don't have to understand. They don't need clear perspective of what they're talking about. They just have to air their grievances constantly and make everything they can touch seem problematic while constantly demanding that it therefore be changed. 
and they know how to make this happen. Teach it everywhere, make it a moral imperative. And they do it really well. Sorry, gone one too far. Each of us has a choice about whether we are going to work to interrupt these systems or support their existence by ignoring them. There is no neutral ground. To choose not to act against injustice is to choose to allow it. Although it does take ongoing study and practice before a social justice framework will fundamentally shape your work, and this part's all in italics, to decide not to take on this commitment does not mean you are being neutral. Indeed, to decide not to take on this commitment is to actively support and reproduce the inequitable status quo. I like that song. <laughs> it is always the primary responsibility, always as in italics, of the dominant group members to use their positions to interrupt oppression. Always. So maybe this all feels a little theoretical or unrealistic. Maybe a lot of you have never heard of any of these theorists. I know some of you have. I know a lot of other people haven't either, and you're right. Maybe these academic theories are being widely taught throughout our schools of education, and they might have some effects, but they're not actually making it out into the real world where a societal solvent can do some real damage. Actually, they are. The infected monkey really is loose in the city, and the virus is already spreading rapidly. You might think it's unfair that I call this a virus, by the way, a deadly, nasty virus. Um, so before I say any more, let me point out that they do that too. In 2016, two theorists, feminist theorists, Brian Foss and Michael Carger, published a paper in a small academic journal called Heneros, Multidisciplinary Journal of Gender Studies, titled Women's Studies as a Virus. I'm not gonna tell you about this, I'll just show it to you. Here's their abstract, it's a little long. Because women's studies radically challenges social hierarchies and lacks a unified identity and canon of thought, it often negotiates a precarious position within the modern corporatized university. At the same time, women's studies offers, by virtue of its interdisciplinary critical and infectious structure, cutting edge perspectives and goals that set it apart from more traditional fields. This paper theorizes that one future pedagogical priority of women's studies is to train students not only to master a body of knowledge but also to serve as symbolic viruses that infect, unsettle, and disrupt traditional and entrenched fields. In this essay, we first posit how the metaphor of the virus in part exemplifies an ideal feminist pedagogy. And then we investigate how both women's studies and the spread of actual viruses like Ebola and HIV produce similar kinds of emotional responses than others. By looking at triviality, mockery, panic, and anger that women's studies as a field elicits, we conclude by outlining the stakes of framing women's studies as an infectious, insurrectional, and potentially dangerous field of study. In doing so, we frame two new priorities for women's studies training male students as viruses, and embracing negative stereotypes of feminist professors as important future directions for the potentially liberatory aspects of the field. I'm not the one comparing their disciplines favorably to viruses like Ebola and HIV, and neither is any enemy of theirs. They are, and their intention is clear, they told us. Quote, to infect, unsettle, and disrupt traditional and entrenched fields by training students as viruses because the metaphor of the virus in part exemplifies an ideal feminist pedagogy. And that's exactly what they're doing very successfully, not just in the academy. Social justice activism has significant influence over many areas of society, especially through social media and using institutional administrations. Not only is social justice and critical theory taught in our universities and increasingly in our primary and secondary education. Nearly every university in the United States and many through the entire English speaking world now has an office of diversity, equity, and inclusion that exists to make that institution compliant with critical social justice. Peter this morning talked about bias response teams at over 200 universities. He didn't say so, but they amount to the Red Guard. 
they induce struggle sessions. And this, many of these offices require people to write statements of their commitment to ideals of social justice, particularly diversity, inclusion, and equity, including self-reflective statements of how they've fallen short in the past sometimes. Not only are these requirements political litmus tests, at least potentially, for hiring, the compelled confessions they sometimes contain can be potentially useful for firing too, should somebody later step out of line. Even he said he's a racist. This isn't just in our universities. Law societies, many corporations, even some cities now have diversity officers. And the diversity training industry in the United States alone is above a $10 billion a year industry. This is an industry that produces no tangible product whatsoever. And almost none of what it does is supported by evidence in its favor. Some of what it does is, has evidence against it. It may proceed from good intentions, but it ultimately exists to evangelize for critical social justice, instruct in critical theory, and induce individual and institutional compliance. And it works. Large corporations such as Google and the BBC have fired employees based on the basis of complaints couched in social justice terms. These often follow from social media, outrage induced by articles written in popular media venues like BuzzFeed and Vox, which have dedicated themselves to the project of mainstreaming critical methodologies. Bigger media outlets have taken up the charge too. Why can't we hate men? Was a headline in the Washington Post. It was written by the editor-in-chief of a feminist academic journal of rather high standing. White women, come get your people, was in the New York Times following the 2018 midterm elections. Other major companies get called to account for their products. To just pull one example among many, Macy's recently found itself at the center of an outcry that began with one offended person on Twitter. They had to cancel the product line and publicly apologize for producing a plate that showed portion sizes in relation to jeans sizes, which was considered fat shaming. Online platforms themselves increasingly ban and block and otherwise punish users who produce content that can be deemed offensive, as Peter pointed out, even by proxy. YouTube regularly demonetizes videos. It seems to have transgressed some standard. These are sometimes seemingly arbitrary. Facebook has become so vigorous in its censorship that years old posts that are being read out of context by its algorithms occasionally result in account suspensions and bans. And Twitter has updated its rules to ban all kinds of speech, in particular, that which they call dehumanizing language for religious groups, as well as gender critical feminism and the words of all those who do not accept trans people's stated gender or even sex identities. This effectively means that handfuls of activists or the most affluent and politically active sectors of society or the, inter the internal cultures of a handful of our corporations like Twitter, Facebook, can censor social media, which is sort of the new public square. Social justice Activists are very visible on social media, and they're particularly keen to punish people who are influential within the arts and within media. Calls for the punishment of artists who have spoken against or stepped out of line with social justice are often referred to, as you've heard now, as cancel culture. This is a chilling practice that involves the utter destruction of someone's career or reputation, if possible, for something she might have said decades ago, even as a teenager. The black actor Kevin Hart was forced to step down as host of the Oscars, for example, when tweets containing gay slurs, old tweets, were discovered. The actor Matt Damon incurred online feminist wrath by saying that sexual assault occurs on a spectrum and describing a pat on the butt as different than rape. Game show host Mario Lopez was pressured to apologize by an online mob who was outraged by his view that parents shouldn't uncritically accept a three-year-old's self-defined gender identity. 
tennis superstar Martina Navratilova was mobbed online for arguing that it's not fair for trans women tennis players to compete against natal women. Feminist Megan Murphy was permanently banned from Twitter for saying that men are not women. Feminist giant Jermaine Greer was declared not a feminist for saying something to the same effect. This is, I think, my favorite one. Slate Magazine even recently published an article insisting that Robin D'Angelo's white fragility has a whiteness problem. <laughs> because mostly white people who are D'Angelo's explicitly intended audience engage with it, and according to them, they do so so that they can become what critical race theory now calls good whites. It's not good to be a good white. Examples aren't limited to these. I get emails literally every single day. It's quite depressing. Talking about yet another walk of life that's been infected by social justice and critical methods. Rock climbing, hiking, knitting, craft ceramics, Catholicism, Lutheranism, Americans and Buddhism, the Southern Baptist Convention, personal finance, law societies, New York State and city schools, Dungeons and Dragons. The examples actually are kind of nearly endless. Nothing can be safe from a critical theory because nothing can be perfect. So what's happening then, as my friend Mike Nana over here with the camera says, where Marxist revolutionaries believed that power was tied up in wealth, and so step one was to seize the means of economic production their immediate successors, the critical revolutionaries that we have today, believe power is tied up in how people think and how we communicate. So step one is to seize the means of cultural production, like education, media, art, language, and religion, including the, the, the limits of free exercise for these. Put another way, social justice is yet another and a long historical line of ugly and self-serving power grabs, allegedly designed for our own good. So we have to ask, and then I'll be quiet, how could it have come to this? And I'll tell you, it's the exact mistake that liberalism exists to manage and hopefully avoid. It is this, our ideas often look better on paper, that's on the outside of the box, the picture, than in practice. I'll tell you a quick personal story, key in on what I mean. I was in exactly one fist fight, a real fist fight, as a child. I was about eight. I was with my best friend, of course. He was three years older than I was, a little bit bigger and stronger. It ended, spoil that for you, it ended with me on the ground getting repeatedly punched in the face. This isn't a hero story. It's not a victim story. This is an idiot story, and I'm the idiot. I can't remember the circumstances, I don't want to lie. We had had a few weeks of um, relating kind of badly. It was summer, it was really hot, things were getting tenser, you know, a fight was going to break out. At the time, I played a lot of video games. And those games had given me a theory about how fighting works. <laughs> it amounted to this. Jump kicks. <laughs> are the most powerful fighting move. <laughs> so if it ever came to a fight, I would just do a jump kick, and I would win. <laughs> Simple as that. So once the fight came, remember how it ended, it didn't matter that I didn't have the slightest idea how to do a jump kick or fight. I believed and I knew that jump kicks were the most powerful fighting move. I knew it could work, so that's what I did. I ran straight at the guy, stuck my leg out in front of me, and jumped at him. <laughs> in hindsight, I guess we could say I was testing my theory against reality. <laughs> the details of what happened next aren't really clear. <laughs> I don't think it took very long to get to the point. It all ended pretty fast with me on my back on the ground getting punched repeatedly in the face by an 11 year old who I did not defeat or even hit with my jump kick. <laughs> so the truth is our theories, which have been called the best laid plans of mice and men, often look better on paper than they work in practice. They oft go awry. The famous line continues. So let's scale up a little. 
Take communism, for example. On paper, communism presents the idea that an advanced technological society can organize itself around cooperation and sharing resources so we can minimize human exploitation. The injustices that spring from the disparities between capitalism's winners and losers can be eliminated. That's the picture they put on the box. And it's kind of not that bad of a picture if you look at it that way. But what's inside? In application, communism has generated some of the greatest atrocities of history. Millions dead, tens and tens of millions starved, shot, and dead. Communism is a great example of the human tendency to fail to appreciate how our best theories can fail catastrophically in practice, even when the adherents are motivated by an idealistic vision of the greater good, perhaps especially then. Social justice isn't communism, but it has some similarities. On paper, social justice says we can eliminate bigotry, oppression, marginalization, and injustice, and heal the world. We can remake our society to be more fair and socially just. Nobody will be left behind. Everyone gets an equal start. Everyone will be treated fairly and with respect. That's the picture on the box. What's inside? The wholesale rejection of our shared liberal tradition, the same tradition that defeated the Nazis, they really don't like Nazis, partly from this very room, which even survived one of their bombs. The same values that took us to the moon ended slavery and invented modern medicine. Social justice demands that we reject human freedom for the greater good. It demands that everyone toe the line and follow its vision and rules, rather than the contents of their own character, their own best judgment, or the contents of their personal consciences. This is because social justice believes those freedoms, as they told us, obscure and maintain oppression. And this will fail. It will fail for the exact same reason that communism failed, and that is because it rejects liberalism. Social justice tells us if we could all just care a little more and care in the right ways, which they'll tell us, we could have a fair and equitable society. We just have to get everyone on script. We all just have to commit to a lifelong process of dismantling our own complicity in theoretical evil and start thinking in socially just ways. We all must become critical theorists. To do it though, we will have to do away with liberalism, with freedom, because then People can't choose the wrong things and mess up our theoretical plans for a utopian society, just like with communism. The limits of freedom in a social justice society will be defined by critical theorists. Their job is to do one thing, scrutinize every conceivable cultural artifact for hidden injustices, speech, food, dress, text, performance, outcomes, everything. The point of a critical theory is not to understand a liberal society, it is to change it and to replace it with something that openly rejects liberalism. It is to apply constant and cynical criticism to, to everything, everything, until that happens, even Dungeons and Dragons. I promised to speak to critical methods here today, so here's the truth. Critical theory is a means of applying uninformed and cynical criticism to cause a social and political revolution. It exists to get rid of liberalism, to limit freedom, to control thought and action for our own good, which it says we can't be trusted to know. Their constant cynical criticism is a solvent that will dissolve our liberal societies if we let it. It is already dissolving them now. Again, my friend Mike Nana has pointed out, nothing can long survive a persistent enough cynical critique. Not an individual, not a movement, not a piece of art, not, a mas not masculinity, not a society that has done everything it can to reject and detest racism. Not right and wrong, not an institution, not a nation, not Dungeons and Dragons, not anything. And critical theory can be applied to literally anything 
Absolutely anything. You don't even have to understand it. This is the truth about critical theory, and we cannot let this happen. So I'm here today to warn you, we are late to this fight. This is already well underway. Thank you.